It's 3.30 in the morning and we're far underground in one of the deepest trenches of the Pacific Ocean. A hole has been drilled down through the ocean floor and a small microphone has been fed through the hole vertically downwards. We are listening to huge plates shift subtly but on a colossal scale. We hear an echo of a long reverberant but distant boom. Then, nearer the surface, a thud on the bottom of a submarine. Further up, a string of bubbles. Behind another vessel, there is attached a substantial length of cable. Along its line, there are 12 waterproof speakers. As the vessel rises to the surface, the ocean floor hydrophone records the following sounds. One sound per speaker in slow succession. A man asleep in Denver. A girl asleep in Chibok. A woman asleep in Guangdong. A parent asleep in Gaza. A doctor asleep in Keta. A person asleep in Kent. A family asleep on the move. Something away from the earth, awake, listening. and I'm a composer and writer and maker of things and hopefully mischief. Just one more mouthful. Just one more lungful. Just one more lungful. Stop. Think about it. I know some of you probably don't like to listen to some of the weird stuff that I do, made out of bombs and stuff, so you'll be pleased to know we're not playing this one. Uh, but you might hear some sounds. So, for example, you'll hear the sound of this tooth uh, being pulled out of my mouth just before we started the tour. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Could you do that again? If you didn't like that sound, you might want to put your fingers in for the whole concert because that, that sound comes, comes back. But really, this show is a dance music show. We're in Bergheim, so really, it's about kick drums. So let's meet one now. But a kick drum is not just a kick drum. A kick drum can also be a toilet roll. Or it could be the sound of a pig's head on a table. Or it could be the sound of a blackcurrant flavored children's plastic bottled fruit drink. Let's go. to just make nice, listenable, friendly music that they can put on whilst they go and work or whatever. There's an aspect to some of my music that's pleasant or fun or enjoyable. <laughs> Entertaining, I don't know. Um, but actually, that's not what I should be doing, you know. I should be making music out of, uh, I don't know, a zoo on fire or financial system or whatever it is that I think is wrong with the world. It sounds bizarre, but one of the proudest moments of my life is that seven, eight years later, nearly three times a week, I talk about a pig 
that was born on a farm in Kent that would have otherwise just been sausages and would have just been a sort of disposable moment. But people still want to talk about this pig, where did it come from, this life. And so the ability with my music to be able to remember one of these animals from eight years ago and to listen to that life and hear it being born and hear it breathe, that act of remembrance for me feels like a powerful idea. And that's the thing that I'm interested in promoting and the idea of listening, of tolerance, of uh, kindness, of uh, dialogue. <laughs> I was there at the birth of the pig. I saw it come out of the mother and recorded it. And I've gone up about once a month since. The first sound you hear is the severed head of the pig dropping onto the kitchen work surface. baseline is the pig's carcass again being put down after it's come off the transporter and the bones being sawed and the main melody is from the blood sort of dripping into the bucket. As a record, it may not change the world, but it's an absurd possibility that we've been totally unthinkable a hundred years ago, you know. To put that in a political context and to put that in a social context and a musical context, then becomes impossible to just listen to it as a piece of music in a way. You know, it becomes impossible to listen to the pig symphony. You know, like, in the same way, you have to. Ch it requires a change in the listener. It requires a different perception, and I think that that's part of my responsibility as an artist is to is to change people's perceptions or challenge people's perceptions. <laughs> Totally amazing yeah, and slightly it's disturbing, which is, yeah, exactly. which is like... It's, well, it's, it's <laughs> Above there you can see this little XLR plug. Ah yes, yeah. And yeah. there's a hole into the tree. Oh amazing. Okay. And there's a little uh, wireless little, okay. mic in, okay. inside the tree. Great. All of my music has been focused on the human perspective. And I thought, what does the world sound like to something else? Like to a tree. It's an amazing noise. I think musical language is really not working at the moment. Whenever I sit at the piano, you know, I've only got five fingers and end up just playing in the same kind of area, the same kind of 
combinations of notes that people have used for hundreds of years. And um, of course, there's always new things to, that you can do on a piano, and there's always great music to be made on a piano. That's not really the point. For me, it's just that it's very, it feels increasingly clumsy way to express yourself when there's and so many sounds and so many possibilities. Even doing this, you're very limited to actually being able to, you know, and you can't play a nice chord. It's like trying to cook an omelette on a barbecue or something. You know, you have to think differently about, you have to approach the thing differently. And, you know, if you ask me to make an omelette now, I'll just make an omelette the same way I've always made an omelette. But if you, if you give me different tools, that will immediately force me to think how to do it differently. 40. Have you used? Yeah, we can. Um, does everyone know an excellent egg peeling technique? What I want left is I want like a, a landscape so that at least half the shell is. Do you see what I mean? So one solid bit, so when you step on them, you can hear like. Like of the thing. Do we have a volunteer, someone to walk on eggs? Ah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Obviously, we don't get many goes at this. <laughs> so should I just make one? Very I think it needs to be, I think it needs to be two. It it's up to you. That's your... Uh... It might be better, no? Okay. Cool. Uh, you should do two feet, then. That's okay. Okay, so then I just... So can we have the red light, please? Okay. have a huge power with where I choose to put my microphone. You know, I could put it in front of my own mouth and start singing, but that's probably the least interesting place I can think of. I'm much more interested in putting it into dark corners or places that I haven't been before, or to listen to stories I haven't been told before.
when doing the pig record, for example, you record all your pig stuff, and then you go and listen, and you listen for drama, or you listen, you listen for events, you know? You listen, f and that's going to be your noise. You're going to be, oh, the moment the pig grunted, or the moment the pig bashed into a wall, or, or the moment someone slammed a door in the background, you know? And that becomes your moment, and actually it's a series of little moments of drama where it's actually, that's another form of a lie, or that's another... It didn't sound like that. You might have had 24 minutes of calm before the pig went... You know. So I think it's a real problem, actually, with them writing music out of these sounds, is that you look for... You automatically look for action or drama or conflict, or you look for the moment when the state changes, rather than the ongoing state. Everything's just gone so much quieter. The birds have stopped singing. Like the whole forest just seems completely... Even the road seems less, I don't know. It's a very strange feeling. The one thing that I noticed when we started to cut it down, the, it started to make this, like, noise inside the tree started getting louder. So we need to... Uh, we need to go back and listen to that to see what that was, because it did sound extraordinary. It's like a white noise thing. It might just be the, it might just be a cable or something technological. This morning, this tree was still standing and functioning and passing sap and thinking, you know, preparing for next year's seeds. And now it's like, it seems very sad after 180 years. Once it's dead or once its function has changed, very quickly it becomes something else. It's almost instant. So we have a microphone here, and we ask you just to make three noises, just as the mic goes beneath you. We're going to ask you to shout the English word, us, after uh, nine. Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. OK, very good. And then we're going to do OK, thank you. And then we're going to ask you to do a clap like this, like two close together, like kaka. Okay, right, here we go. We're going to do this after 17. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Super. Okay, so the last thing we're just going to get you to do is just go... We're going to do this after... One, one. Thank you very much. Get, get strong. Get, get strong. You pump the blood out of it. We will put the heart back in it. You
with a single dry sound, no reverb. It's the sound of this book opening slowly in the late morning, quietly though, as if read in private in a dark corner. The paper subtly creaks as the spine separates and opens. A tiny buzz from a nearby table lamp is the underscore. The crease of the paper on the first page turn mixes with the wet ping and dry crackle of wood on a fire. Once the page turn is finished, there is a too soon silence. Within that void, you can hear your own breath bristling against the hairs on the inside of your nose as you exhale. There are two of these exhalations, but on the third, a surprise. A recording of a strong January wind catching the remaining winter leaves of four old oak trees artificially planted in a row. The sound is contained though, as if through double glazing. This wind fades up over a minute, slowly evolving. The higher frequencies filtered out in a slow sweep as we become aware of a tone that simultaneously contains a hum, a whine, a throb. The lonely, dull drama of a Boeing 777 at night. The book was an idea I had 15 or 16 years ago. It wasn't a book, it was just a piece of music called The Description. And the idea was just to describe a piece of music instead of actually, um, instead of writing it. Each of the chapters comes in from a different perspective. So one chapter is different types of silence. One chapter is about eating um, and about food. One chapter is about waiting. It says really clearly, finally, once and for all, that says exactly how I hear the world and how I think music should be. It's a kind of description of how the world sounds right now, like this minute. So, for example, right now there's people involved in car crashes, there's people having sex, there's people uh, eating, there's forests being cut down. We have satellite images and satellites flying above us. And so it's a little bit trying to think about what if they were microphones on there instead and we were able to focus in on different parts. Part of the political background of the book really is the idea of listening, listening to sounds, listening to voices, listening to people, listening to circumstances that we don't always necessarily hear. And they're also sounds that I haven't necessarily heard but feel like I should have heard.
for those of you that haven't been here before, we have like people making stuff in that corner. Um, we have a band here behind that will be playing the pieces of music that we write. This is probably the hardest day in terms of delivering a finished piece of music at the end of the day. Um, today is technology day. I started to think about number crunching. So how many people are going to be born today? How many people died in Berlin today? We're going to ask for your help to try and find some of those numbers. First of all, we're going to build a new instrument that will work very quickly, hopefully, and within a space of 40 minutes, one hour, we can have some noises going from it. I like the idea of if we're going to be collecting number and data throughout the day, be it on the internet or, or phoning up and getting these numbers, if then if we were able to create something that we then put those numbers into and then get some kind of sound out of it, depending on, on what those numbers are. Yeah. yeah, another way of doing the number of people that died would be to look through the newspaper and count the number of people that died in the newspaper today. Ah, okay. Wissen Sie, wie, wie ich in Erfahrung bringen könnte, wie viele Menschen heute geheiratet haben? Ich muss das unbedingt wissen. If we attach these to something like the thing that he was bringing, then it'll make loads of crazy noise, and that's pretty fun. Um. <laughs> Sounds good. That is dry. Thank you. It was difficult to find out the exact number because the birth, deaths and marriages office closed uh, before we could ask. Um, but based on an estimate from someone in the audience, we've got a figure of 79 people. So you'll represent 79 people in Berlin that died today. It's, the whole thing's kind of weird. Um, so I guess we need a sound that represents, represents that. So if we can just do like a, like a, like a, like a last breath. Okay, one, two, three. Very nice. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, Jan and Hugh built the, do you have a name for it yet? Trolley. Trolley jazz. Trolley jazz. You can type in a number. So Jan is representing the births, so it's like babies plus trolley. Um, yeah. And then I also have the sound of 79 volunteers coming up and breathing one breath, and that's this noise. So. In the numerology of this piece of music, when you hear that, that's 79 people dying. And when you hear Jan's trolley, that's 183, that's 183 babies uh, today. it again. It wasn't good enough. The whole idea of the births, it should spring out like that. So we need more cackety cackety cack from here. I don't know if you can process it and do it. Maybe you can stick a mic in here and just like, like babies, madness. We need more madness on the babies. Okay, here we go.
We're outside a place called Thanet Earth, and Thanet Earth is a collection of giant greenhouses, and when I say giant, they are giant. They go on for acres and acres. The greenhouses growing peppers, tomatoes, and cucumbers all year round. And it's really crazy. If you come here at night, you can see all the lights on, and there's this sort of weird orange glow. The lights seem to be, every time I've gone past, the lights are on, so it's like, it's always, there's always growing going on here. It's always using resources. And uh, this, is, this is just one of the sounds in the book about food. It's just one sentence. It's one moment, one sentence in one chapter. So it's a small detail, but actually for me and living around here, it's a huge, ugly eyesore. And of course, we don't get to see inside. I am curious, but I suspect it will just be the sounds of heaters and maybe the drip feeders of dripping things. So it will just be, everything will be mechanised. You won't, certainly won't hear wind coming through the leaves of the plants. You won't hear bees hopping from flower to flower. You won't hear skylark. No. So, yeah. Maybe one day we'll get access and, uh, yeah. We'll try and go in and see what it actually sounds like. But I think it will sound really boring. You know, I try and live ethically, but I still fly long distance um, to do gigs in Japan or Australia or something like that. Um, I try to eat organically, but that's still, you know, that's still the death of an animal. I still need to eat. I still, you know, try and buy food from good to healthy places, but it still needs food, needs growing and transporting and shipping and comes in plastic wrappers and paper wrappers and trees cut down to make sleeves for my records. And, and the records are made from a plastic which is gen derived from oil so you know there's parts of the horrors of the Iraq war are embedded in every bit of vinyl that I've sold and the tax that money that I make is taxed by my government and they use that government to sell arms to people and start wars and uh, whatever else they choose you know that they think is appropriate so I'm as much a part of the problem as anybody else you know so it's trying to it's trying to apply a kind of democratic principle to the listening process as well. So not to not to make it like a, um, just a polemic or just a, uh, a horror story of other people's lives or decisions. You know, it's got to be about my decisions as much as anybody else's and the consequences of my actions.
Yeah. yeah. Mm. That would be okay. That would be okay. I think I'd be happy to get him down in another half day or something. So. All right. Okay, cheers. Bye. I'm working on a remix, a kind of recomposition or reimagining of the Adagio from Mahler's Unfinished Tenth Symphony. Mahler's grave is a very simple grave. It's literally just a straight, plain piece of stone with his name on it. And so I asked that we could record there, re-record the opening passage uh, for a solo viola. I haven't heard this yet. It's the first time I've heard this. One of the reasons to play it at Marla's grave was to take the music back to him, you know, um, that his body is actually, uh, actually there. Just the idea of a tenth symphony comes with a great deal of history because many people didn't get to a tenth symphony. It was understood to be a symphony of death, and in fact, Marla died before he could complete it, which is why I felt able to touch it or go near it somehow. There's a lot of friction in Mahler's work in quite subtle ways and there's frictions in his own life between his Judaism and his Catholicism or the friction between him and his wife or the friction between him and his peers and things. So I'm trying to sort of re-establish that. Ready for your close up? <laughs> yeah. I've had to see, uh, we've got hair and makeup. <laughs> Could be here for some time. Cool. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll just yeah. Uh, yeah. show you where it is. We went to his grave, and then later we'll be going to a crematorium. No, this afternoon. We have to go. Well, the thing that we're going to do next is we're going to record inside a coffin. That's been sorted out. Hugh, have you got a cable to get from the iPod to the. Um, the idea that you could choose your soundtrack for the oh, afterlife. Right. So you could lie in there, put a piece of music on and, you know. Let me see. I, it was just, you know, the stack of them in the back. We'll put the microphone inside, close the lid. So it's, it's be what it would be like if you were buried listening to this piece of music. I'll also record from outside the coffin, so you'll be able to hear what music sounds like when it's inside a coffin or something. I have to say, it's quite a strong vibe here. It feels quite, it feels very uh, particular. Really what I'm trying to do is trying to add layers of meaning and uh, layers and textures and references. Thank you very much. Suddenly you're beginning to infuse the recording with a new circumstance or a new fabric, a new texture, and in this case, the texture of loss or the texture of passing on to a different stage or something. So these details, they all start to add up, and the urn that we got comes with a place to put a picture. So we put a picture of Marla in it, and the person listening to it won't necessarily be able to hear that detail, but it changes how I interact with it. It changes how I put it together. So consequently, it starts to, I think, 
inform the listening experience for everybody else. Inside the urn, inside the crematorium. Necessarily, that it's Marla's body that we're saying goodbye to, or something. It's, you know, it could be goodbye to the last century. It could be a, a goodbye to the idea of what music used to be. Or it could be a goodbye to what we think of the possibilities of sound. It could be a, a goodbye to my career after doing this. <laughs> it's a departure of some description, and. If I'm very honest right now, I don't know exactly what that is because it's only by doing it that it begins to reveal itself. It's very hard exactly at the stage to say what worked and what didn't. It really is a bit like making a jigsaw but not knowing what the picture is. Thinking you're maybe making a ten-piece jigsaw but actually you end up with a thousand pieces or something. And then trying to assemble something after that.
I grew up playing classical music from the age of four, playing piano and violin and playing in orchestras. And um, I was just taught music, the traditional way of reading music from a score and uh, with an emphasis almost entirely on performance. I was raised a Methodist, which is a very particular sort of working class Protestant Christianity. It's very simple, quite humble, but it never really resonated with me. I enjoyed the music and I made some friends there and I did it because I was young and I didn't know any different. In the 80s, technology was sort of democratised in many ways and the ability to record music at home became a real possibility. So I got a four-track tape recorder and I was able to start recording. And then I bought a sampler when I was 16 and that sort of changed everything for me. It came with a disc that the person had made in the shop and it was like, everybody dance now. This song, and he chops it up onto the keyboard. So it's like everybody, everybody, whatever. And I'm like, wow, it's like I can sound like the records. You know what I mean? I was like, I was so like, I was so amazed that the power that I'd just been given. And I sort of took it home, and I like, you know, I saved up all my money, and then took it home, and I was like that. Do, 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 do. Everybody, do that, do, do that. After about five minutes, I'm like that. Okay, well, that's the end of that. I mean, that's totally unsatisfactory. <laughs> it's totally boring. But it had a microphone input in it. So being a boy and being a teenager, you like, you know, and you're like, you know, you start to mess around like that. And that's pretty silly and a lot of fun. And then you're like, well, what else makes a noise? It's stimulating the brain because suddenly you realise that the whole world's making a noise and that you can take anything. Suddenly you've got the world's biggest keyboard. For a musician, it's a revolution because up until the invention of the sampler, or I guess in the tape recorder, all it, it's all impressionism, basically. It's all it's a it's an attempt to replicate. It's a it's a simulation. If uh, Mahler wants to write about birdsong, it's a flute. <laughs> but for me, and for my generation, and for the possibilities in the 20th century now, you take a microphone. You record the bird song. So instead of having to write music about something, you can write music with that something. If I wanted to write a piece of music about a McDonald's burger, I don't have to try and come up with a bass line that sounds like a bit of beef and some and some lettuce that represented by a xylophone or something. I don't know how you do lettuce, so maybe we can all have a think about how we would do a Big Mac. With, uh, with music, but you know, it's hard work. But now I can just, you know, I can go to a drive-through and get a burger and stamp on it, or set fire to it, or throw it against the wall, or, or eat it and then puke it up, or, or take, it to, uh, take it to the farm where it was produced, or you know, whatever it might be. I can interact with the world. In London, the head of a sticky mop, twisted, turning, squeezed into a plastic bucket. The remnants of blood, water dripping in uneven thick droplets. The shuffle of a nylon tunic and the slip of a pair of bangles down a wrist as a hand moves further along the mop handle. Another twist of the mop, fewer drops. An unexpected cough, a security turnstile 
Someone else is pulling on gloves as a supervisor repeatedly flips their phone in silence. Elsewhere, inside the cheap plastic toy model of a refuse truck that was received as a present some years ago, a two-year-old battery has leaked and created a kind of crusty webbing between the toy's driver's seat and the door. This acidic crust has created a tiny, subtle, high-end rub at the point of impact that otherwise would have been a simple, smooth, brittle snap when stood upon by an oblivious parent. As we hear that noise, the stereo image opens up to a stacked soundscape of two communities of families living on and among rubbish dumps somewhere in the world, each recorded from an omni-microphone slung from an extra-long series of cables strung beneath a pair of cranes. Bulldozers, seagulls, a multitude of drowned out voices. So this is a recording booth that I've built for an installation called This Is A Voice. I must oil the gate. So we have instructions which say take a deep breath. When you're ready to record, press the red button. Now sing one note for as long as possible. It will stop recording when you run out of breath. Your voice will automatically be looped and added to the chorus. You will hear everything outside this booth. So it starts with a single voice, which is mine. And then slowly what happens is that we've programmed it so that every voice comes in in the order in which it was recorded. And we go from one voice to however many have been recorded. At the moment, it's about three and a half thousand. So it goes from one to three and a half thousand quite quickly in the space of about 30 seconds. Um, so we're beginning to add voices now. And these are all notes that people have chosen themselves. We haven't told them a note. So it just builds up and up and up, and then after it reaches its peak, then it removes the voices in the order they've recorded until we're left with the last voice recorded. And then it goes back to me again and does a cycle. So that's the whole that's the whole piece. It was supposed to feel a little like a confessional or something if you're asking people to give their voice. But what I wasn't expecting it to feel like was a memorial, actually. You know, in a way, the, the recording booth is empty, so even though we're here at the end of the day, all we can hear are the voices of people that have come through in the last 10 days. So it's a memory, in a way, of everybody that and it keeps them living. It's an afterlife, if you like, of everyone that's been through here. something meaningful doesn't have to be just serious. When we 
made public the fact that I'm doing this book. Somebody suggested that a DJ should, during their DJ set, stop the music, read the description of the track, and then carry on with the music, which is a super idea, you know, but you're there to make people dance, so it's how far can you move away from that before people just feel angry because you, you trick them. You don't want to trick people. Uh, that's not true. You do want to trick them, but you don't want them to feel cheated. And again, yeah, please. The chapter of writing was about silence. So it's a long list of silences. For example, the silence um, on a plane when it feel when it's very, very bumpy and everybody just goes silent, like all the conversations stop, like no one talks to the person next to you. It, the whole plane just goes silent. So that's a silence. The moment you get to the airport you realise you left your passport at home. That silence, you know, or the silence when you, um, just before you kiss someone for the first time, or the silence just when you're in the forest and you hear an animal near you and you stop and listen, or the silence after a racist joke, someone telling a racist joke or something, you know, and you suddenly realise something's shifted, something's changed. And so it's been really fun thinking about all these little gaps in life, you know? An in-breath of someone you love towards the end of their life, followed by the silence before you jump into a cold lake, then an out-breath of that person you love, then an in-breath, then the silence of a baby just before it starts breathing again after a seemingly endless pause. An out-breath. The silence of a painter just before the brush touches the paper. An in-breath. The silence after you realize you just killed someone. An in-breath, the silence inside a large plane on a runway before taking off on a night flight. An out-breath, the silence before a prayer at a family dinner. An in-breath, the silence before the light turns green. 
there's so many cliches about the artists at work and being crippled by self-doubt or being mentally unstable or having alcohol problems or what have you. It's just your brain getting in the way, overthinking things. I remember writing the record and sitting down at my piano in my kitchen and and I literally, it was a real presence behind me of journalists and audiences. I could it sort of almost had like a row of journalists behind me and then behind them an audience at a gig ready to hear, right, okay, what are you going to do next? And me playing the piano and I can almost hear them all go, oh, that's a bit boring. Uh, I can't believe you just played that or... And then you play something else, and then they go, oh, this is going somewhere. And then you play a chord, and then, oh. It was like this weird imaginary crowd behind you that was examining your every move. And uh, it was a really strong presence and crippling as well, really crippling. I can see how some artists that have, musicians or writers or what have you, have produced something that a lot of people have gone out and bought in a big way, nothing much more than the, what I'm talking about, you know. Created some kind of iconic work like Harper Lee or something like that. I can really imagine the struggle of what it, of what it means ten years later to sit down and try and write something else, you know. Feel this presence and this weight of this expectation. So, and actually sometimes it's just the act of doing, you know. And the creative act is is no different, I think, in some respects. Erzählen Sie uns doch bitte etwas mehr über die Brexit Big Band. Please tell us more about the Brexit Big Band. I was born in 1972. And so my whole life, really, I've been a European or felt European. And when Brexit happened, it was such a shock that I felt like I had to do something. So I thought, well, the best way to do that is to try and live the principles that I think are valuable or worth holding on to. So in the end, what the Brexit Big Band actually is, is it's a collaboration with musicians and singers right across Europe. And we're trying to create something that's almost the opposite of Brexit, something that is generous, something that is open to everybody. important thing is the swing. Let's be kind, keep an open mind. Oi, but you're here from the band, so... Oh, okay, here it comes. Let's be kind, keep an open mind. Let's be kind, keep an open mind. Let's be kind, keep an open mind. Let's just do that once more. Um, and give me five seconds. Um, can, we, can we just do it more like... Uh, just, it just needs to be ruder, I think. When the band recorded this, they went, they'd had four beers before they played it. So you have to do your four beers, best impression. I like fuckers if we like, leave all the fuckers, you know, like.
Exactly, perfect. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> and maybe with a shot of uh, tequila afterwards. <laughs> okay, go on. fish docks at Grimsby and we're recording the next bit of sound for the Brexit big band record. Grimsby is interesting to me because it's uh, voted overwhelmingly to leave the EU. Grimsby had a very clear identity which was all about fishing. Fishing, fishing, fishing. And that's gone. You know, there's hardly any boats left. There's hardly any fishermen left. It's so iconic in terms of the British sense of identity about what it means to be British. Fishing is all caught up with that. And of course, our national dishes, fish and chips, or our mythological dishes, fish and chips. And something as relatively simple as fish and chips that allows you to talk about identity, about the environment, about structural decay, about capitalism, about division, all these kinds of things. It's a way in, so really with the recording of sounds, I'm looking for a way in to talk about these issues and to give me a steer on what the music is about and how to write it. Okay, we're ready. You ready? Right. Do, okay, so, very good. Yeah, do you want to come? Do you want to just come here? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, for a number of years, I have um, made music. And um, after the vote for Brexit, I wanted to try and create a project that told stories about Britain, regardless of Brexit. And one of the things that I wanted to do was not just be in the South, but actually travel around and speak to people and find out different different experiences. I guess you've seen a lot of changes, right, in the fishing industry? Yes, I have really, yes, yeah. Uh, but you can't beat fish and chips when you come to the seaside. <laughs> no, no. And did you, did you used to, um, because presumably now all your fish is imported or is... It's from, from Iceland. From Iceland, yes. yeah. Was there ever a time when you used to sell... We used fish? to get it, yes. Oh, going back in the... 70s, no yeah. sea fish yet, yeah. Yeah, local fish, but no, it's nearly all like overland now, Iceland or Scotland. We used to get Scottish, oh, yeah. but Scotland okay. we used to get a lot yeah, from. Yeah. Were you given a choice about doing this or did you? Uh... Um, not when I left school, no. <laughs> <laughs> did you try something else? Did you go um, yeah, I, did. I, have worked, I have worked somewhere else, but now my mum's going to retire, I feel like. Because it was my granddad's shop before oh, wow. my mum had it. Oh, so right. okay. Nobody else has been in the shop and I feel like I should carry it on, really. And then my daughter, but she's not here, she's 12, she works here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the gym, We've got no here. choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
music. So we can do it and throw the oil. Yes. As long as you don't break that. Well, that's all right. We bought it knowing that it probably. Ah, oh, right. Well, right. we can compare and contrast before. <laughs> <laughs> can I just say for the record, I'm not a trumpet player. Oh, right. You want to take batter? Yeah. Can we yeah. have a little batter no, to it? Okay. Let's take it's all the time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Though I did drop my mobile phone in and it worked after. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Everyone will be wanting to do it now. <laughs> People with saxophones and drum kits. And I could have recorded a chip shop just locally, but I wanted to take a risk and get out of my comfort zone and all the rest of it. And consequently, now I feel like I have an ethical responsibility to Brenda and Alison and not betray their trust by just doing something totally stupid and flippant with it. I mean, look, you can't get more flippant and stupid than defrying a trumpet. But I want to take it very seriously. <laughs> Like a kind of, uh, it's like a kind of drum roll. This is the potatoes being washed. Like a... <laughs> I don't know. Uh, chat, chat, chat. I'm writing a duet, a sort of love song for one person to stand on the shore in Britain and someone to stand on the shore in France and sing to each other across the channel. And we put a call out for someone to swim the English Channel from Dover to Calais. We recorded them swimming. Normally I would record most of the sounds myself, but for this record, because it's a giant collaboration and because I can't be everywhere all at once, I farm some of this out. It was a very long day, particularly for Emma, who spent like 14 hours. What's interesting with this one is it feels like a really good metaphor for Brexit, which is there's something romantic about swimming between England and France. I've commissioned it thinking it was funny and had a serious point to it as well, but we're like, let's find a way to talk about our relationship with our neighbours, let's talk about us being an island, let's talk about us trying to be connected. 
but also let's think about if it all goes wrong can we swim to Europe you know if Britain turns into this right wing horror show channel swimmer again makes me feel quite frivolous just being in a studio just listening to someone else's hard work. Just trying to do love, the sounds of love. Mm. Wondered what that might sound like. I started to write the long lists of sounds to do with love. And I was struggling, so I decided instead to just describe one sound and describe it in very precise detail that takes three or four thousand words to talk about this one moment. This is a reference to uh, the, ga the war in Gaza recent the recent war in Gaza uh, where so many people were killed and so many children were killed that they ran out of space to store the bodies and so they stored some of the children's bodies in ice cream freezers and uh, it just so such an extraordinary image so it's for me it's it's a uh, this is the sound of a father sat next to an ice cream freezer with their child's body inside it and about love so it's about all the sounds of just that moment and um, again it's not something that I've witnessed but it's something that feels so powerful to me and uh, yeah so it's quite a uh, you know when you write it's almost like putting on a costume or becoming a character or something like that and so consequently these moments become quite sharp or quite intense somehow. Particularly as I have two children, as you can hear. <laughs> That's the thing about sound, you can't turn it off, you know, it's been everywhere today, whether it's tractors, aeroplanes, boilers, 
roads, children, chickens, peacocks, birds, you know what I mean? It's this it's life. If it makes a noise, it's alive somehow. And I think it's very hard when you work with it not to see, not to feel like you're working with the material of life somehow. I had a sound, I had a sound that I hadn't heard before the other day, which it was raining really hard. And uh, I was like, what's that strange noise? Like, I was walking along and I couldn't work out what it was. And after about 30 seconds, I realized that it was the rain falling on the top of my head. Uh, but because I'm bald, <laughs> you just, just hear the rain. It's like a sound that only a bald man can, <laughs> only a bald man can hear. Um, in fact, I should put that in the book. Yes. Um, you want to sit in the middle? No, no, you, I sit wherever you... Yes. You, just t you tell me where to go. Yes. It was a hard book to write, and I've been trying to write it for 20 years. About 15 years ago, I recorded 3,500 people eating an apple at the same time. And it was for Plat du Jour. Plat du Jour, yes. yeah. Um, a record made out of food. And, and I sat in the studio, and I listened back to the sound, and I, and I thought, actually... I might be the first person in the world to hear three and a half thousand people <laughs> bite an apple at once. Quite likely, yeah. Unless there was a medieval apple eating competition <laughs> that we don't know about. I feel spiritual, actually, as well, because you think, well, actually, I, it's the first time I've heard that, or a human might have heard that, but uh, if God exists, right now, there's three and a half thousand people biting an apple, and now, and... And now again, and now again. Or if there's aliens listening to this planet, then they can hear people eating apples, like huge numbers of people <laughs> biting an apple at exactly the same time. Or the government, or WhatsApp, or Facebook, or what have you. I remember being 20, 20, 19, 20, and getting a sampler and biting an apple and into the sample, and the sound just being... Unbelievable. I mean, just incredible. I still have a sound. It's still incredible. It's like fucking with the fabric of time. I mean, you feel like... You feel like somewhere between Stephen Hawking and Jesus and Jimmy... <laughs> <laughs> Jimi Hendrix. It's just like... <laughs> and all you did was bite an apple, but it's the, wor the noise, the world noise that you've unleashed. You're like... It's like you've been given the keys to the universe. It's unbelievable. So as a capacity to understand the world, it feels, um, it feels extraordinary. And I'm just working with um, astrophysicists at the moment, trying to listen to the universe. And that's what's really thrilling at the moment, is starting out making, <laughs> starting out making techno records 25 years ago. Th through the technology, you suddenly like, find yourself thinking about the universe. We're here in Hamburg at 
the Elba Philharmonic and a few weeks before Brexit, whatever that means, politically we have no idea what's going on. It's still a complete mess. But the record's finally finished and we ended up with more than a thousand people contributing to the record. <laughs> recording sessions in Madrid, in Leipzig, in Berlin, in Rome and in London. So it really starts to feel like a representation of some of the ideals that the project was trying to support, which was collaboration, the imagination, and it sounds really banal but fun as well, because Brexit is not fun at all. And something really nice happened, I think, whilst we were making the Brexit record, which is I started the project with the tree, and actually the sort of two big, it started to merge into one. The Big Band record now opens with the tree. We hear the sounds of the Hamburg forest, and then we hear some people singing in the distance, and then slowly we hear the tree being cut down. But separate to the Big Band record, we'll also release the whole week's worth of recordings. So we're going to call it A Week in the Life of a Tree. It's 168 hours of audio taken from the tree in sequence up to the point at which the, the tree was chopped down. It feels really a critical part of, I guess, the environmental message of a lot of my work or environmental concern, which is we're living in a crisis, we're living in an emergency, and so what are we going to do about it? You know? And I think that's, the tree's really emblematic of that. So even though the tree's gone, the world that it inhabited and the sounds of it live on. The message for all my work is that we need to listen more carefully. So I'd hope that on finishing the book that people would pause and listen a little more carefully, even if it's for 30 seconds, or notice the, the bird outside or whatever it might be. So it'd be nice just to feel that you would encourage people just to stop and listen for a little bit. That's, that would be a nice, that'd be a nice thing. And then of course immediately then go down and kick out the kick out the right-wing governments all over the world and install ones that are, that are genuinely representative of the population. But, uh, but yeah, that's probably a little too much to ask for. <laughs> yeah. The sound of an object leaving the earth. The sound of the friction between the atmosphere and the earth as it spins. The sound, the sound of, a of a dense, dense collapsing, collapsing mass, mass as it, as it hurtles, hurtles past. The sound, the sound of a body, body breaking, breaking up, up into its constituent parts. parts. The, the impossible, impossible sound of, of solar, solar winds. winds. 
the sound of a continuous bombardment of particles. The sound of gravity hurling a distant planet round a distant sun. The sound of the distortion at the edges of dust. The sound of black holes collapsing. The sound of light as it passes through virgin space.